What's going on, everybody? This is Jordan Nahisi. And I just throat goat Mo. What's up, people? And welcome to another episode of Culture 316. This is episode three. We are using some new technology and stuff, so bear with us. We're in a great transition period. Um, but let's just get right. Actually, before I get right into it, I do want to thank everyone who's been tuning in to these episodes, sharing the content. You guys are greatly appreciated. We're going to be promising to give you guys more stuff uh, coming soon in the long run. But please be sure to keep liking, subscribing, commenting, rating the podcast. Give it a five stars. That's how we get it up there. So without further ado, let's get right into the show. Um, so first thing is first, uh, NXT Heat Wave uh, went down last night, Tuesday. This is actually Wednesday. And kind of wanted to know kind of some of your takeaways from the show. For me, I did not expect Heat Wave to be as fun as it was. Um, it was definitely banger after banger. Mm. If I had to pick out the matches that stood out the most to me, um, of course, I expect the Santos versus um, Tony D'Angelo to be a, like, you know, the biggest takeaway, which it was. And I still think it should have been the main event. However, even some of the matches that I was sleeping on, I had no interest in, mm. like Cora versus Roxanne. I didn't care for the two of them as a concept. I didn't even care for Cora's heel turn. Mm. However, those two show the fuck out. Absolutely. At first, within the first hour, that to me was the it match of the night up until I saw what Santos and Angela mm. did. Um the other match that definitely stood out to me, um, which it's not a shocker because I feel like Carmelo Hayes always, always, always is the moment. Right. Like he doesn't have to do very much, but him versus um Vinci, Vinci, whatever the fuck his name is. That match was fun. It was actually very, very fun to watch. I like that it was um one of the openers to Heat Wave. Mm -hmm. It was fun, it was fresh. I noticed the whole entire night it was just a fun flow. There was not a dull moment that went on in the show. Well, actually, there was one, but we're not going to go into Quincy because who is Quincy? <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, um, I, I wasn't expecting 2.0 to actually impress me, but it was definitely a fun night. I actually, no, let me backtrack too. Let me backtrack. I normally don't give Mandy Rose her flowers, mm. and I desperately wanted the belt to be taken off from her that night. But um, I was actually very much impressed with her match with Zoe. I actually was. Um, normally, like, I don't, uh, I'm not really high on Mandy's wrestling skills, but, you know, especially for me, since I don't watch 2.0 consistently, like, I'll take a week off in between watching it. I noticed that she definitely turned it on. When it came to her wrestling, she definitely turned it on. Like, she showed me that she definitely could be a powerhouse when she wants to be, that she could be aggressive, that she doesn't have to be just a pretty face. And I actually had to applaud her. Even though I didn't want her to win, I was ready for Zoe to take that belt off of her because I'm a little bit sick of this toxic attraction, you know, reign of Mandy thing. Right. I had to give her her flowers because she definitely carried herself like a champion that night. Mm. Um, so overall, if I had to give that whole entire, I guess you consider it like a pay-per-view, right? Would you consider uh, it? Um, I, 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 think guess you can, I guess you can consider it a pay-per-view. I guess. I would I would definitely probably give it like an 8 out of 10 mm. just for how fun, how fresh, the pacing. It was a good time. I was entertained. I was thoroughly insane. I feel that. How about you? I feel that. Let's give a, a clap for that. I don't know if you can hear the sound effect. Oh, we got applause We have now. applause. Oh, look at us. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. But I would actually align with that. I think it was an 8 out of 10 as well. There were a couple of things that I had noticed, some takeaways um, from just the show in general, as well as kind of like, well, match for match, I would say, like things that I pulled away from that. And then the overall message that NXT Heat Wave kind of sent to me, the number one thing that I noticed was Paul Heyman doing the introduction of Heat Wave. Um, so that to me, that, oh, yeah. that was the number one thing that stood out to me. For those of you who are unaware, Heat Wave is actually a, a ECW pay-per-view. Heat Wave was something that was produced by ECW. So the fact that Paul Heyman was integrated into that was definitely a nostalgia based move. And I think it, it was perfect. And that I think brings me to one of my, my first points is that I think that NXT is going to start being the home of a lot of uh, WCW and ECW's intellectual property. 
um, we're going to see that as a consistent thing between, you know, them doing the Great American Bash, which was a w- WCW pay-per-view. Obviously, War Games was a WCW thing, and now we're getting Heat Wave. I can see WWE using NXT as kind of like their funnel for the intellectual property that they've acquired over the years um, being, being utilized. And I think that it's a very smart thing because, you know, a lot of the times we talk about a lot of old acts in WWE who would be used as draws for WWE kind of being controversial and have murky pasts, but they're constantly being used for nostalgia purposes. But now they have a way to kind of incur that nostalgia without necessarily having to be controversial. So I think that that's a good move. Um, the second thing that I noticed was that um, what, like when you were talking about Cora Jade, I think she's posi- being positioned as an AJ Lee page esque character just this very dark aggressive very moody but she's doing it in a way that i think that is it's going it's refreshing and it's fresh and i and i really 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 like it and enjoy it i was able to watch the the match with roxanne last night and roxanne is fantastic by the way she's so so good she's so so clean and fluid in the ring and so so young and it's it's i feel like when i watch her uh it's kind of like how I felt when I watched like Tyler Bate or Pete Dunn for the first time. It was like these these are she's a super young, technically sound wrestler, and you can tell that like the sky is going to be the limit for her. So I'm very, very excited to see where they go with that. And I and I feel like this is not going to be the last time that Cora and Roxanne cross paths. I think that Cora's gonna be the one that takes the belt off of Mandy. Oh, I just want to make a quick introduction. Um, someone called us out on Twitter, and I didn't even notice it. Um, I like how you made that connection with um, Cora, uh, you know, emulating a little bit of AJ Lee. Yeah. Someone made a very good um, point on Twitter about how Roxanne actually did the page turner. Mm. No one actually like, I noticed that. I didn't even that. that. So, and, you know, yeah, I had to look it up, and I'm so happy you just brought that right. up because, you know, you're bringing up AJ Lee. Page was um one of the foundations to 1.0 right, absolutely you know what i mean so i love the fact that they um they they uh in, they involved that inside the inside of the match or whatever um because at first when i was looking at both cora and roxanne i was looking at them as both being replications of aj which kind of turned me off about yeah. them but i i like that she's paying homage mm. to Paige without necessarily being Paige. i feel like out of the two roxanne just have her own character Cora as a heel now, what I could appreciate is she is coming to her yeah. own. She definitely fits better as a heel. She's not as cringe. I'm so happy she got rid of the Avril Lavigne skater yeah, boy. Skate, right, I hated that. Thing. that. That skateboard had to go, child. I was sick of it. But as a heel, I love it. I love it. I love the way she carries herself. I love her aggression. Um, I like the way she tells a story in the ring while she's a heel. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but she just tends to just do everything better more fluently more naturally i definitely had to give it to them but yes moving on i think it's instincts right i think it's her heel instincts are probably higher than her face instincts and that's a good thing as well being able to play towards your strengths another thing that i noticed and this is my second to last point um legato is going to the main roster there's no way there's absolutely no way in hell that these guys are not going to the main roster i think that they're main roster ready um, as a faction, I think that they're probably one of the strongest, if not the strongest, in the current NXT 2.0 product. And I feel like this is a good way of get him getting written off of NXT. But just I was watching the entrance, the presence that uh, that Santos has is just like, yes. And, they, and, and somebody on Twitter said it. They found their next Latin America superstar. You know what I mean? I feel like they were at first, you know, obviously you have the greats, you have Ray, you have Dominic kind of coming up in the ranks, but they had a they couple had that Andrade missed like out. Alberto Del Rio, right? Like he was a guy that WWE put a rocket on and that fell by the wayside, you know, for the right reasons, because he needed to get packed up out of there for what he was doing. Um, but I... I think that they found their guy in Santos. I feel like Legato is going to the main roster. I feel like they're going to be on SmackDown um, as opposed to Raw. But I do see them going to the main roster uh, in the near future. Uh, So that was what I pulled away from from that. And now we can talk about the ending. I just interject. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Well, can I just interject a Go little ahead. bit with him? Just because I love him so much, and it made me mad that um, Vince had fumbled the bag with Andrade because I was thinking of how much of a banger that we could get <laughs> with Santos versus Andrade. Andrade if he was still sticking around. Um, I also was thinking about how good of a match I would love to see um, with Santos versus Ali. I think that's definitely a banger. But also, it, I couldn't help but be pissed off about Dominic's existence because I think that if Ray was solo and by himself, that would be one of the coolest ways or one of the coolest feuds to set up Santos when he comes onto the main mm-hmm. roster. Me personally. I think, I think it's... Like, I felt like... Keep going, keep going, keep going. No, it's just that you have someone deemed a legend already mm-hmm. in 2.0 coming up against, like, literally, like, Ray's, like, like worshipped as, a, like, a Mexican, like, god. Literally. You know what literally. I mean? Literally. I think it'd be really interesting. I think it'd be really cool just because the few kind of writes itself to have the legend versus, you know, the god of wrestling in Mexico. Absolutely. But, again, I feel like Dominic's kind of in the way. I don't hate him. I just kind of wish, you know, he kind of went off to the side and let Ray do a few more things with some up and coming superstars instead of having him, you know, tag along as a sidekick. Mm-hmm. But that's just something I wanted to just get off my chest because there's so much you could do with right. him. Like, it's like, all right, you failed me with Andrade. Please do not fail me with this man because he's money. He's, he's delivering. He's money. Yes. He's money. Yes. Yes. The fans are going to love him. Even the people, the people who don't like watch 2.0, 2.0 now, when they see him on the main roster, they're going to gravitate towards, uh, gravitate towards that like very quickly. You know Absolutely. what I mean? So I, I, I don't know. I just wanted to get that off my chest. And, rightful, <laughs> and rightfully so. I was going to say, I, I feel like they were able to plant a little bit of seeds when Ray did his little visit in 2.0. There was like a little backstage segment that they had. So they can go somewhere with that. Now, I definitely wanted to touch on the ending because you were like, Twitter was going off about it. I'm going to say this. I like the ending. I like the ending because i am here for a world collide (laughs) too for those of you who are not aware uh world collide was a pay-per-view that nxt and nxt uk did uh, a couple years ago for survivor series weekend and it was fantastic um the only thing that was like a hiccup to me was nxt uk is doing a, a nxt uk championship tournament and literally just got underway the brackets have just been filled and then Tyler walks onto NXT as the NXT UK Championship, and is like, "Well, we don't have to guess who won the champ the, the tournament." Um, but uh, at, like Braun Breaker versus Tyler Bate, I think can be a banger. And between that, between B Priestley be doing her backstage segment, will Blair Davenport Davin, Davenport. Um, I think we're gonna. God, I, love I think her. we're gonna see uh, uh, NXT versus NXT UK worlds collide, especially with Hunter in the mix now, um, and especially with Sean running NXT UK. So I definitely see that pay per view, and that's the reason why it excited me. Not necessarily because of oh well, you know the the tournament and this that and the third. Just the fact, just the fact that that can be a thing again is attractive to me. Um, because at first I thought that NXT UK was going to disappear, especially after the um, the speaking out, you know, allegations and like that roster got gutted. So at first I thought they were done for. But like seeing this pay-per-view gives me hope uh, because I feel like there are a lot of good matches. Hopefully we get a chance to see the British rounds in the U.S. because I know you haven't seen that, the how the NXT UK does the rounds. Oh, so good. So no, damn good. So how does that work? So it's kind of like a, it's like a, I think it's like 10 round, three minutes or 10 rounds, like a minute and 30 per, per, per round. And it's kind of like, it like, I'm trying to figure out a, a way to, to say it. So essentially enough, it obviously you win the round, you can win it by pinfall or submission, but like also there are scorers who can rate each round. So if there isn't a pinfall or a submission, there's still like a winner of the round. Um, but it like, they're like, depending on who's in the match will depend on the flow and the story of it. Cause you can do something illegal in the first round. Right. 
but it could lead to you having a, a win in the second round or a win in the third round. And so it's a very, very interesting kind of method and flow. It's very, very hard to explain. I'm missing some details. I'm putting that out there right now. I'm definitely missing some. No, pizza. it's fine. No, I, I get where you're coming from. But it's it's it's, it's kind of merging like three different matches in exactly. my head. Exactly. But it's it's it, it sounds a little bit like a gauntlet, but it's time. Right. But it's only two and, people. And know. it's only two people though. Um but I, I like it though. I like it. It's different. It's definitely different. I would love to see an American competitor kind of compete in one of those style of matches because it's very, very traditional British wrestling. So that was what I got from it. How did you feel? I had to watch. How this. did you feel about the ending of, of the show? The ending of the show or the ending of the, the match? Ending, Sorry. Uh, I would, you know what? I would say the ending uh, of, I'll do, I'll say show, ending of the show. Okay, because I'll be honest, when I saw Quincy, I checked out mentally. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was like 10 minutes left, and I saw this man on my screen, so I'm like, oh, like, please don't tell me this man's going to end the right. show, because his last match was terrible to me. But um, I thought that they didn't choose the right ending hmm. for the show. Um, like I said, I had it I had it play in the background, so I didn't even see who, who won. Right. But um, they had, they had like momentum going throughout the whole entire show and then that happened and i don't i don't feel like that was the right choice i understand it's because it's your world title it's your biggest title for your show Mm. that it should on paper go on last but i personally felt with the way they had put basically all their budget into santos and um d'angelo that that should have just ended the night and i think everyone would have been fine with it like you know, they they had put so much effort into just the video packages, making it feel serious. Mm. Like, that was just the few the entire night that I think everyone wants to pay atten- attention to. And I felt like they should have definitely swapped spaces mm. and just left it on that. Right. Because now the cliffhanger for the crowd is, does this guy t- go to the main roster? If so, how soon? How are they going to introduce him? Um, now, do they have a bad match from, the, like, the clips that I saw? No. Just... Again, compared to everything else that I saw, yeah, definitely wasn't a, a, a match that was like, you know, had a alluring effect on mm. me. I could see that. I could definitely see that. Um, huh. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I, 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 I do think that, that, that the Santos D'Angelo match was definitely main event worthy. I think it was just the cliffhanger for a, a possible NXT, NXT UK match, I think was a I don't want to say it was a greater cliffhanger, but I think it was a more intriguing long term cliffhanger as far as what yeah. ha- what's happening within the NXT world. But you know. Hey. Um do you want to move on? Maybe I'm biased <laughs> because I don't really watch UK right. as much. Like I don't dislike UK. It's just that it's you know, for the average person that tries to keep up with three to four shows a week yeah it's very easy to kind of put uk on the back burner i'll try to keep up with a pay-per-view here and right. there and they have some great matches some great talent um like i said i was i pop like crazy when i saw be a priestly show up you right. know so you do make a good point because um i think hunter does want to remind people that they exist yeah. again because vince didn't put any effort and so that when these people came on to 2.0 um or even on 1.0, like when Tony Storm, Storm came in, like I think a lot of people were confused right. or they didn't really know how to take Absolutely. her because they didn't watch the uh, actually, I don't want anyone to spoil that, <laughs> but they didn't watch where she came right. from. They didn't watch where a few other people like Ray Ripley came from. <laughs> right. I, I agree with that. But no, I totally get your point. I, I agree with that mm-hmm. for sure. But let us move on. Um, So obviously there was a full week of shows. Uh, Raw. SmackDown, everything in between. Uh, kind of wanted to get into like some quick analysis about the shows, what you noticed, what were some takeaways, what things stood out to you about each show, especially since you, you know, you're a prophet now, right? You you literally called <laughs> the hit row return, and the next thing you know, the vibe is back. So I, I definitely wanted to know your takeaways from SmackDown, Raw, all of that. Oh my god. Uh well first can we just jump into Hit Row Absolutely. just because um I'll be you know, I was just I was just so excited. Like honestly I didn't expect for them to show up like literally five days after I just said 
on the mic that they're going right. to show up. But I love the way that they introduced them. I love that the, the, the pop that they got from the crowd was so electrifying. They came out and they, I feel like they almost proved everyone wrong. They came in with a purpose and they wanted to show everyone that they didn't need a fourth person right. in order to have this faction going, that they could hold their right. own. Um, I thought their their um, tag team match was fun. It was fresh. And I love the way that they closed it out mm -hmm. when they were saying the original OG3. OGs. Yeah. I feel like, again, they were trying to make a point that, yeah, we're not we're not getting a four person anytime soon. We're doing us. Mm. You know, we came in as a, as a trio. We're we going to ride as a right. trio. And then it almost made me think to myself for a moment just how um, how much. Uh, what were their names? Um, Enzo and Cass. And um, Big Cass. Yeah. yeah. For some reason, my brain made a connection to them mm. with the way they had the crowd wrapped around the finger uh, around their fingers. I'm like, yeah, they're definitely going to be like that for um, for, for at least Friday Absolutely. night. Absolutely. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. They're definitely going to be, um, yeah, they're definitely going to be a group where we're, we're going to see a lot more promos for them. Um, you know what I mean? Um yeah, I'm You're sorry. good. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm a little bit tired. Yeah, right listen, now, so I might, listen, I might, yeah, listen. You, <laughs> listen, I, it's it's eight on the west, eight some on the west coast. So I get it. I was gonna say I agree with the hit row <laughs> analysis. I think that they were definitely one of the highlights of the show. Being able to bring them in, um, the entrance obviously fire. Like I just love their match, their flow, their chemistry. Like they very much remind me of like the cool kids in high school. That's just like posted up like you know that like, like like they're the cool kids and i like that vibe and i just like that the fact that they've kind of built this this fan base and this allure even through their absence right like people wanted them back and 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 so i i think that they're gonna definitely do damage i see multiple tag team title reigns in their future um and i think that that's gonna i think that that ultimately is going to lead to a deeper tag team division in WWE as a whole, but definitely on SmackDown. Um, I definitely want to see how uh, a LDF versus Hit Row on SmackDown would translate into. I think that that's oh, going to be that's going to be a banger of a feud, a banger of a match. Um, so I'm really, really excited about Hit Row. I would say another highlight of that show was the Intercontinental Championship match. Good God. Um, mm -hmm. They they main evented the show, and rightfully so. They literally stole the show. I think they stole the show, in my opinion. That They got 25, I think, yeah, 20, 25 minutes as, as a mid-card title, which I don't think that mm -hmm. we have seen in a long time. And then Gunter uh, cut this promo online afterward talking about the prestige. And it was like, this feels important again this feels super important again. And I love it because the truth, the truth of the matter is that not everybody can be world champion. Not everybody can be the WWE, uh, you know, undisputed WWE universal champion. And I think that one of the biggest flaws that WWE had when it was under Vince's reign, especially when Brock was the champion, he was absent was now immediately assigning prestige to the intercontinental and the U S championship because the WWE or the World Heavyweight Championship wasn't around. So the fact that they're building prestige while the champion is still active, while the champion is still showing up, it's only going to do wonders for them in the long term because now they don't have to rush prestige. It's like, okay, well, if you ain't here, we got these titles here, and they are also just as important. And I feel like Gunter is a great champion. I think that he puts on great matches. I love his presence. An incredible shape, like... I'm just very, very, very excited to see where this goes in the future. So I think that was kind of like my my analysis on SmackDown. Hit Row and the Intercontinental Championship were definitely the highlights of that show. Did, did you feel like you got a little bit of um, vintage Nakamura in I that did. match too? I did. I feel like we got strong style Nakamura. And I think that that was important. And I think that that mm -hmm. was very intentional. I feel like you know, part of the reason why Shinsuke was brought over to WWE was because of, of, you know, the, what he was doing in new Japan pro wrestling and the, and the foundation and the legacy that he left behind. And, and I noticed that, you know, Shinsuke, I'm not noticed, but Shinsuke being in this match was definitely an intentional decision because one of the last things that Shinsuke did in new Japan pro wrestling was build the prestige of the, of the IWGP intercontinental championship 
So I feel like him being put in this picture kind of brought him back to a place where I'm not the rock star. I'm not the guy who says one word. I'm not the guy who does a little, you know, five G's in the middle of the ring. No, 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 no. I'm the king of strong style. And I feel like the king of strong style is back. And I love that. And I love that for him. Yeah. Um, another thing I wanted to add, not just with him, but everybody looked like they were having more fun yes. in the ring. That's one big thing I noticed from both Raw and SmackDown. Like the part that popped me <laughs> during nothing more is match was one of, <laughs> he went up to, um, he came out the ring and he yelled out nine. <laughs> Really loud. <laughs> so what? What was that guy's name? I'm sorry, I forget. Um, um, Gunther's partner. Uh, um, I for- I forgot his name. I Ludwig. Ludwig. Is this a, Lud- yeah? He just like he just yeah. He just pulled one of his strong style, style moves, slid from underneath Gunther's legs, and then just went up to him and yelled nice, <laughs> and just went back into the ring. I was like, he's having he's way having too way too much fun. fun. Yeah, but that makes. But I'm like, I love mm-hmm. that. I love that. Like all the wrestlers that come in, they they have more energy during their matches. I felt like when, um, if you were to compare from like a month ago to now, a lot of the people were just kind of doing everything automated mm-hmm. as if it was just rehearsed and just trying to get through these two to fifteen minutes. Mm-hmm. But again, like I noticed that, like, and it shows in their faces, it shows in their energy because, like, now they have they they have more pull. They could kind of do what they yeah. want and be who they want to Absolutely. be and i actually love that for mm-hmm. them because it makes me feel excited as a fan to watch when i see that you know the the talents themselves are having a good time and that they have free reign absolutely you know like now now the world is their oyster they can like literally take their character and their story as far as they want because they're not um constricted to like a small script or being told that they could only uh, condense their moves set into a few few moves right. for the audience or whatever. So that's just one thing I really love. That was like definitely my biggest takeaway from both Raw and SmackDown. I agree with that. I was going to say, now, speaking of Raw, we can go into that just a little bit because obviously <laughs> um, going from SmackDown into Raw, at the end of SmackDown, it was announced that it was going to be Bobby Lashley versus AJ Styles for the U.S. title. That match delivered. Um, once again, another 20 to 25 minute match, both guys felt like they, they had something to prove. Even the video packages kind of outlined the fact that these guys are both future hall of famers. These guys already have championships. These guys are already world traveled. And so this is the first time ever that they're meeting in the ring. And I'm like, that's a great way to build prestige. It's like, this is a first time matchup. You got two guys who are, you know, powerhouses great at what they do. And I feel like they didn't disappoint. I think it was a great, great match. Now, the question is, how do they top that? Um, Obviously, Bobby retained. I want to see who the next challenger is, who's going to step up. Um, But I, outside of that, there were a lot of interesting things that were happening on Raw. Uh, And I wanted to know if you had gotten any big takeaways from what you saw on Raw. No, oh, Kevin Owens was my biggest takeaway. Yes. Um, I actually loved their callback with um him and Drew McIntyre from um 1.0. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that they led the promos with that and that um Kevin Owens just made it blatantly known that like the old him is coming back mm-hmm. and he's definitely gonna be fighting for title belts this time. I don't think he held a title belt in like what five, five years. years. Um and they they definitely put on a banger themselves. And at first, at first, I actually was upset with the ending. Mm-hmm. I was just like, why would they have that end an interference, a match that good and long? Should have definitely had a winner. But then I'm like, wait, no, I'm thinking like Vince, because Vince would have definitely had had one of them lose and they had a rematch and they had a rematch or whatnot and then put it on a pay-per-view or whatnot. And you can't have two people been built up just like that in one promo, making references to the banger they had put on years yep. ago. And then have one of them immediately lose and then establish that this person is more dominant than this person. So when I thought about it further, I'm like, all right, you know what? That was a clever call because now now I'm interested in seeing what more do these people have to bring to the table, Mm -hmm. you know, because I haven't cared for. I always care about Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens, he's he's a fascinating human being because he'll take any script or any position that he's in and find a way to be 
funny, entertaining, relevant or whatnot, even if he doesn't have a belt on him. Drew has been a bit of a disappointment to me, not because that he's bad at his job. It's just his booking has been so ass that I just have a hard time investing into him the way I was invested in like 2018 and prior. Um, So I love this for him because it's definitely going to build his stocks again. Absolutely. Um, to me, that was just like the funnest match of the night for me personally. I definitely agree with that. I and I loved. I actually once like to kind of align with you. I agree with the whole like I didn't un- I didn't know why it was booked the way that it was booked, but I felt like if this is a new Kevin Owens, he has to be kept strong, and I feel like the booking that they did on this definitely kept him strong, definitely kept him kind of like, this is a force to be reckoned with. And if you noticed, he was really the only one that kind of walked away on his own accord, right? Like he was the one that stunned everybody said, you owe me one. And that was, that was an interesting thing because who is involved in a bloodline storyline, Sami Zayn. So, are we going to see the? Are we going to see a reunion? And he mentioned that he can go for the tag belts. Are we going to see them become a tag team? Which I definitely wouldn't mind. Um, but yeah, I like. I think that that was a really good booking decision in hindsight because it kept kind of kept him looking strong. I feel like there were the another thing that I noticed was still that WWE, even though. Hunter's kind of like having an influence and he's taking control and there's going to be more creative freedom. I feel like WWE is still going to be a place where the big guys, the larger men are going to be more prevalent. Uh, I feel like they're not going to get away from that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's okay. I just feel like it's going to like they they can be big and whatever, but they have to have a certain nuance and a certain edge to them. They can't just be, you know what I mean? Just, just big like that can't be their personality trait um and so that was another thing that i kind of took i feel like it's in any wrestling company right i I, that was another thing that i kind of took away from that and i just love how they continue to plant seeds uh for long-term storytelling um the hand on the wall in that backstage segment did you see that it was on twitter oh yeah 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 it was a very like is this a bray wyatt tease is so I, I'm very, very interested in knowing what's to come. I feel like there were a lot of seeds planted, and I think that that was a very, 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 very intentional, and I think it was a great thing to do. I was going to say, did you have any other takeaways from Raw? Um, I guess Bailey. Hmm. Bailey was on SmackDown. She's on Raw. Ba- I, I feel like I see them bounce. See them bouncing back and forth, like with with this with the with faction, this yeah. But um, definitely Bailey, yes, um, definitely Bailey, mm. because like I admire her so much now, from where she has definitely came up from Absolutely. in NXT. I know a lot of people were very high on her and Sasha, and I I will always give her her credit for what she has contributed right. for the women with that match at um, Takeover Brooklyn. That match is iconic. That that match um, definitely self, set a foundation and a pace for um, women in coming forward, you mm-hmm. know, to be able to be taken more seriously. Um, but as far as Bailey herself, it's just her evolution is just so beautiful to me. <laughs> because when I viewed her in comparison to the rest of the other four horsewomen, I, I kind of thought that she... I don't want to say she didn't belong, but it's just that she um, was the least advanced to me. Absolutely. Um, her character was very stale, very awkward. It was a character that only could resonate with a small audience, children. Yeah. Um, she was very awkward on the mic compared to the rest. And Charlotte can't talk for shit, so that says a lot. Um, <laughs> her moveset wasn't bad because Bailey can definitely wrestle. However a lot of her moves aren't as interesting or doesn't get as much pops yeah. as opposed to what Becky, Charlotte, and Sasha bring out in the ring. I mean, Charlotte, when you think of Charlotte, you think of, yes, her finisher, but you think about when she could do a beautiful Spanish fly or her 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 50-50 moonsault. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that. because some, Sometimes they hit, sometimes they Not don't. Not her D-plus moonsault. Sasha, she's so innovative. Wow. Not her D-plus moonsault. <laughs> Sis gave her a 50-50. 
I'm with. It's because sometimes she lands it, and then sometimes she doesn't. I don't know what's going on with Charlie and the moon salts. I don't know if it was the implants throwing off the balance or Probably something, was. bro. Yeah. But every time she did, Probably was. <laughs> every time she did it, it it like she just didn't land correctly, it, or she 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 had like this much space from her part or not her partner from her opponent. Right. But anyways, let me get off of Charlotte because I'll drag her for the next 30 minutes. If you let me <laughs> um, back to, to Bailey, it's just, it seemed as if she didn't even connect to her own character when she was the hugger yeah. and I couldn't even connect to her. It made it so much easier to just put her aside next to Sasha and just make her a lackey. Because again, Sasha had a personality that could, um, you know, engage with little girls that want to be like Sasha, but even adults, because she she has um, a very mature like character. Right. You know what I mean? That reminds you of a lot of things. Yeah. With Bailey, like I said, it only it was confined to a small audience. Yeah. So when she had like this heel turn back around what twenty nineteen, I want to say twenty nineteen, going to twenty twenty, yeah. and. She kind of went from that to this dramatic haircut and then this whole slightly emo phase or whatnot. At first, like I said, I didn't want to believe in her at first because she gave me a whole lot of nothing. Right. Um, and I don't want to completely blame her. But it sounds like I'm dragging her to fill. <laughs> I don't want to completely blame her because she was white hot in 1.0. And then Vince decided that he just wanted to ruin her with this uh, Alexa Bliss, This Is Your Life. That was disgusting. Um, Storyline segment. It was disgusting. It got it was crickets the entire time. And Bliss was trying her absolute hardest to work with this. And again, it was just crickets and it was awkward. And it's just like, why are you doing this to Bailey? Like, right. come on. Like she literally put the woman on the map and you're just gonna sit here and bury her. Now we're gonna look at her as a joke. So to see her do this, um, in 2019. And then for her to basically take over the pandemic right. and hold down the women with her Sasha, and Sasha, that was there. She era. definitely showed us that she go hold. That was their era. Yes, that was their era. definitely. Yeah, I know a lot of people um, have uh, that. That's a whole polarizing topic in their own. You know, it's because they were holding all the belts and everyone thought they were hogging everything. Right. Like, no, I I think that they most definitely deserve that. I think Bailey most definitely deserved that because she sacrificed herself to this company and she got she got chewed out mm -hmm. and people didn't want to take her seriously and we watched her from there on slowly evolve with her character from going um from being emo to being obnoxious but I so loved, obnoxious yeah, that it I was it. fun you know what i mean that's when she right. just randomly started with this whole ding dong hello thing and it just stuck with us and then she slowly moved on to being almost like a Joker like character. Yeah. Not quite like where she was losing her mind like Becky, but she was still delusional. Yeah, still maniacal. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. And what I love watching about her is that over time I got to watch her come into her own and be comfortable with herself and be comfortable in her own skin. Because mm -hmm. you could tell when again when she had that damn ponytail, the side ponytail on her head and whatnot that she wasn't really comfortable or believing in herself. Yeah. But when she is in this role, whether she was a tweener or a heel, she was very much comfortable with herself. Yeah. So I love that for her and her character has been a slow development yeah. to where I have watched her add more moves. She has definitely um, added more moves to her moveset, changed up her finisher, um, got more, Sorry, I have an error coming up on my screen. You're good. <laughs> um, she has gotten more comfortable <laughs> speaking on the mic. Um, before, she would be so meek and timid, and she would almost stutter. Right. Like, now she says everything with her full chest, which I love. Full chest. Uh, yes. And, um, you know, I, I, I almost felt bad for her during the, that time she got injured, and she was to have that I quit match with Bailey because she literally was riding off of this crazy momentum. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I knew that and I and we had and we had so many different like predictions for like how that match was gonna go. Mm -hmm. Like we were thinking like is 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 that gonna be the match where she decides to go full on heel and cut Bianca's braid or whatnot? Right. What happens when Bailey loses? What is she like? What's she going to do? She came back and she innovated herself and we watched her go go from being a lackey. We could never talk about Bailey without, without talking about Sasha. We went from talking about her as basically being a lackey. So now watching her change up her look, go with this red hair, this whole outfit change, and she's a leader of a faction, mm -hmm. and we're all just going with it, and we just love right. it. Now we could actually just think of Bailey just as herself 
and not have to constantly think about Bailey and Sasha. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So, and it's it's funny because, like I said, if you would have asked me what do you think about Bailey about three four years ago, I'm like, uh, oh, Bailey. I mean, she's okay. She's all right. You know. No, now people would have me like rank the four horsewomen. I definitely would put Bailey. It, Bailey either neck and neck with Sasha or right behind Sasha right. because. She definitely came into her own. Absolutely. And I just, I love that for her. And I can't wait to see the way Hunter's going to book her. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. What do you think about her evolution? So I think that Bailey, when she kind of came from NXT to the main roster, had good moments. But I feel like as she kind of got deep into the main roster, I would say about four to six months after she kind of made her transition from NXT and she was still in her I'm a hugger character, I think she outgrew the character. Because she outgrew that version of, you know, of Bailey, And that's okay. That happens as people. We outgrow, yeah. you know, old things about us. But I feel like she was kind of kept mm-hmm. there because Vince saw her as foil for everybody else. She essentially elevated all of the Vince faves. Uh, Alexa, Charlotte. Yeah. So I feel yeah. like she was kind of kept in that box intentionally not because she wanted to be there, but because of what she can do for other people. I felt like there was a point in time where, you know, even before the the heel change or the, you know, the character change and the heel turn, she was probably the most decorated out of all the four horsewomen, but I don't feel like it was because she deserved it. I feel like it was because it was needed for her. Like she needed the belt. You know how we talk about like with, with guys, it's like, Oh, such and such needs the belt. I feel like Bailey at a certain point needed the belt in order to kind of keep her in the same conversation as a, as a Sasha, as a Charlotte, as a Becky, even though she was just as gifted, if not more gifted than some of them, she had to be given the accolades in order to be like, nah, I'm still just as good. But I feel like obviously with the heel turn, the, the dramatic haircut, as you said, it really elevated her to a new level. And I think that it brought some stuff out of her that, that she was looking to bring out of her. I think it it was a different side to her. And I feel like that was always there. She just didn't know how to express it. And then as we go into her as being a faction leader, I think she's the only one of the four horse women that have led a faction. Now that I think about it, I don't, I don't think Sasha has led a faction. I don't think Becky has led a faction. No, but what about Team Bad? Did she lead they it? Were or the, they were a part of the. They were a part of it. I think they were a part of it. Like I feel like PCB, right? Paige was like the mentor. I feel like in Team Bad, I feel like Naomi was the mentor, and then I feel like, yeah, I feel like they were like in these in the factions, but they weren't leading it. You know what I mean? So I don't think that. Yeah, and they tried it with Sasha, and I. They tried it one time with Sasha with um Zelina and Carmella, but then they kind of just dropped it for some weird reason and then they just became a tag team. Right. Even so though that technically, yeah, you're right. Even though that was that could have been a fire faction. But I think Bailey is the first person out of the four horsewomen to lead a faction. And that adds a whole different layer of credibility to her to her character. So I think that her evolution is very, very awe inspiring. I think that it's dope. So I think yeah, she she just got more comfortable with herself. I think that she kind of grew into herself, as you said. And I'm eager to kind of see where she goes with Kai and Io because I feel like that's been the common denominator for both of them. I feel like this run with her as a faction leader is ultimately going to determine Bailey's legacy because, honestly, you have people under your, your, your wing who, as far as in-ring talent, are comparable to you. I feel like Kai is a great in-ring talent. I feel like EO, obviously great, phenomenal in-ring talent, but their weaknesses are your strength. You are better on the mic than they are. You can lead the charge as a leader, as a mentor, as a mouthpiece for both of them. So I, I feel like her as a faction leader is ultimately going to determine the trajectory of her career uh, and her legacy overall. Um, that's how I, I feel about um, about Bailey's kind of evolution, if you will. And I think that Hunter is going to let them run roughshod. And I'm very, very much looking forward to that. So going from that, going from, I'm super happy for her. So going from that, um, with Hunter in charge, if we're on the topic of the women, with Hunter in charge, do you see the return of the May Young Classic 
and evolution too. And do you think that this is something that can lead to possibly some cross promotional work for WWE and other wrestling companies? So fucking lootly. Like one thing I love about Hunter is that just as much as he is for the men, he is and, and for the mid cards, he's definitely here for the women. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that whole May Young Classic was definitely a, a, a Triple H project. Mm -hmm. I had so much fun watching both the first one and second one because it introduced me to names I never heard of from promotions I never thought about because I always been confined to just listening and to watching WWE, you right. know, like we we seen Big Swole come from there. We saw Tony Storm, Ray Ripley, um, Io Shirai was part of that. Kyrie Singh was part of that. Um, just so many names. And Hunter loves uh, going fishing in the Indies because mm -hmm. he appreciates the Indies. I Absolutely. love that. I know Vince was trying to shy away from it. You know, about a year ago, we got some news about how they're trying to shy away from that. And they're trying to get you know outside athletes and stuff like that, which that's fine and dandy. But I love the fact that you know Hunter wants to get. Um, get faces more shine that are trying to come up in the indies and they are putting in the work and the effort. And he, and he sees a vision in them that he wants to bring to the WWE and make them bigger than life. Absolutely. So, um, I would, I would absolutely love it and adore if they had a May on classic. Uh, I think that would be their third, um, their third season for it. Yep. And I mean, Evolution has been a talk since the very first um, pay per view that they had, which again, that's another polarizing topic because a lot of people are saying that there was empty seats during the show, that no one really cared for it, that right. it didn't get that many views. Listen, I worked at fucking Evolution that day doing security, bitch. I could tell you that the crowd was loud the entire night. Mm. They loved it and they ate that shit the fuck up. Right. And so did I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and I would love to see. <laughs> I would love to see more names being brought back, and I feel like more people would be more um, be more comfortable coming back. Like I know a lot of people, people have been begging for a uh, Melina to come back, especially yes. ever since we saw that uh, face to face thing with her and Sasha. Mm -hmm. And at the rumble, oh my god, that was criminal! The way they just bought her. That was criminal the way they had that woman come out with this extravagant entrance that we haven't seen in years. She did the whole split for us, and they just had her tossed out and like what. 2.5 yeah um yeah and she's literally been saying publicly that she would love to come back right like she hasn't been hiding she has been shying away from anything um i would love to see like legends like uh, uh like melina come back i would love to see jazz come back like <laughs> i'd be elated i would pop jazz. if i had got Bianca versus Jazz. That would be crazy. I don't crazy. care what the match or the stipulations are. If I give me Bianca versus Jazz, and I will scream. Or you can make it a triple threat and throw in Naomi. Right. I would Ooh. scream. I. That would be oh my god. Fire. Are you kidding oh me? Oh my. Yes. That would be fire. Yes. And I feel like some of these people. Yes, and I feel like so many like names want to come back, but they mm -hmm. just didn't like the way the company was being ran, so they don't want to tarnish their own names. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Maybe this might be a chance for us to finally get Trish versus Sasha. You know, that's the match that everyone wants to see, not versus Charlotte. Not versus Charlotte. You know, right. I wanted Lita versus Bailey over Becky, and I like Becky, Ooh. but I really want to see that. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Picking yeah. up what I'm throwing down? I pick, okay. I'm picking it up. I'm picking it up. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like this. Lita versus Like, Bailey. I feel like Yes. Like, I'm not I'm not trying to tarnish what, you know, Lita did with, with Becky, because you know what? It took a lot for her to want to come back. Absolutely. And it was very last minute that they threw her Becky from what I was reading about. Right. They invited her to the Royal Rumble and they literally asked her basically that same day, like, hey, you want to work this angle with, with Becky? So I understand, like, you know what I mean? Like she did try her best. She put on a great match, but the few that definitely would have been that there was one went down in the history books would definitely be Bailey versus Lita. Like if I don't get that, I'm gonna be mad. Mm. I'm gonna be very mad because, like, with with the way Bailey has been investing into her character, oh my god! Like I know that Lita's my skills have never really been there to mm -hmm. begin with, but I can definitely see her pulling something at alita with this little psychotic delusional oh yeah i'm better than you character like i would i would just uh but like hunter's minds like i said it's it's it's, it's freaking amazing absolutely so i can only imagine what he would do if he was the one solely booking evolution this time around 
you know? Absolutely. Um, what is your take on it? I definitely, as you said, I see both events returning with between the May Young Classic and Evolution 2. Um, I would love for Evolution 2 to be in New York again. I would also wonder to see if it would be in Should Nassau be. Coliseum or if it would be in UBS because... They shouldn't do it in Nassau. In Nassau, oh. right? Yeah. Oh. So, I mean, but that's... that's the to crowd be de- sucks. <laughs> that's to be determined. <laughs> um, but I, you're good. Yeah, yeah, you're good. I, I personally think that both events are more... It's more than possible that both of the events can, can return. Um, I think that the Mae Young Classic in hindsight, really set the tone for women's wrestling uh, in the years to follow because anybody that was anybody was involved in that tournament in some way, some way, shape, or form, even down to the confrontation of the two four horsewomen was at the Mae Young Classic. And we've been talking about wanting that match for a while now um, between Bianca Belair, that's where we first discovered her. Io Shirai, you know, a lot of people were introduced to Tony Storm, Rhea Ripley. And these are women, you know, within WWE and outside of WWE are considered at the top of their craft and at the top of their respective companies. So I think that another May Young classic is imminent. I would be very, very curious to see uh, what they would do with it. I do think that it will be with a new crop of people. Hunter is very, very big on get out get get rid of the old let's get in with the new so i feel like if we do another may young classic i feel like it would be a bunch of people that we probably don't know <laughs> i think it and and i think that that's that's going to be the most exciting part about it um as far as an evolution 2 is concerned i agree with you i feel like all of those dream matches are more than possible of happening and they need to happen the the leader versus bailey really just shook me like i really got like goosebumps right now because I feel like what happened in the past five years with when it came to the four horsewomen and WWE's legends, I think that because Vince was in control, you saw him lean towards his favorites as opposed to what the fans really wanted. Because Sasha versus Trish was something that the fans wanted, but they wanted to give so they wanted to give Trish versus Charlotte and it was Trish versus Charlotte and Trish versus Alexa. And like, they wanted to do all these people that nobody was really, really checking for or asking for. But now because Hunter is in charge, I think that we're going to see everything that we want to see, especially out of these women and Lita with the Lita Becky match, like Lita left on good terms. So I think that they're more than open to, to bringing her back and, integrating her into evolution too. Um, now I think that the interesting part is if there would be some cross promotional work, because I think that I don't think that WWE will work with AEW to bring in women talent because honestly, as much as I love Hunter, Hunter going to recruit Hunter's going to recruit. And if there are AEW talents that come into that WWE performance center, you know, he's rolling out the red carpet. You know, hey, Tony, it's been a while, sis. How's how's Tony over there treating you? Oh, he got you going for the other uh, AEW Dark World Women's Championship? Nah, well, you know, I wouldn't <laughs> do you like that. You know, I wouldn't do you like that, sis. You you know it wasn't. You know the vibes. Yo, when, you was, when you was in NXT UK, I had you. I, you was that girl. But, you know, I don't want to disrupt your TBS time. So, you know, but but Tony knows that. Tony knows that Hunter is a recruiter. And so if AEW talents go to WWE, even if even if he locks them down in a multi-year contract, you know, a, a girl like a Ruby Soho is going to want to go back. A woman like a Tony Storm is going to want to go back. Even some of the newer women. Oh, oh, you don't think that Hunter has eyes for Jade? Are you kidding oh me? Oh, my God. Imagine what he would do with Jade. Do you, like, do you... <sighs> Hunter Jade under Hunter's reign. And then you have Bianca and Naomi over. Like, don't get me started. That's a money match. So that's a money match. Those are money matches. So I don't think Mm -hmm. that we're going to see cross promotional work between WWE and AEW when it comes to some of the women, because Tony knows that Hunter's going to recruit. And now I do see impact wrestling getting involved. 
I do see Jordan Grace getting involved. I do see um, Taya possibly getting involved. I do see Chelsea Green, Deanna Perrazzo. I see them girls getting involved. Ooh. And I think yeah. that they would be, I think that they both love where they work, but I think that they can be an asset to the tournament. And so I don't, I think that Hunter would be more than obliged to bring some of those women in if there was another May Young Classic. Um, and I think that it, it's something that could benefit both sides. You know what I mean? Uh, Impact seems to be getting along with everybody these days. Impact, and ooh, I can go on about Impact, but I'm not going to do it this episode. But yes, we can. Oh, but... all right. Say less. We're going to close this out, and I'm going to talk about that. But, but yeah, I... Oh. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. But I, I, I do see uh, some cross-promotional work happening between WWE and Impact, not so much WWE and AEW. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, like you just said, and Hunter knows how to, how to, you know, talk. He, yeah. he knows how to talk, and, and and people already seen what wonders he could, he could do with anyone. He could turn whoever he wants to into a star, and he definitely has proven that. Mm -hmm. So it, it wouldn't take very much to get people he's already on their good side with back on his his side. Mm -hmm. But since we're on the topic of the May Young Classic, um, some interesting news broke out mm -hmm. last night. So Brandy wants to. <laughs> Or has been allegedly um, in the performance center, mm. and since we're on the topic of the May Young Classic, I was thinking if they really wanted to make Brandy come back as a wrestler, because I, I, you know, I read up about her. She doesn't mind being a valet, but she does actually care to want to be a wrestler. She genuinely is trying to be a wrestler. She knows mm. she's not very good at it, but she, she you could tell that the girl's trying. Right. She may be cringy, <laughs> okay. We, we did not forget about that open mic night. She's a black. <laughs> no. <Nah, And>, <laughs> yeah. I'm we did a not black. Forget bitch. That. And she might have been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She was Listen, wilding. She might be a, she might be a hot ass mess when it came to AEW. Similar to how Cody was a bit of a mess over there. However, something about her would fit just perfectly. Mm hmm. In a place as messy as WWE, mm -hmm. where she could kind of bring that and maybe tone it down because, you know, there's still uh, TV 14 at the moment. Yeah. But I think if she seriously wanted to come back as a competitor and she wanted to be isolated from her husband, I think that is a fantastic way to introduce Brandy because you could actually sit there and watch her progress. Absolutely. In the ring. That's that's the most lovely thing about the Mae Young Classic. Yeah. Because you get all different types of breeds. You get people who have been on the indie scene for a couple of years. Some people have only been wrestling for six months. Some people that just decided to just fill out a, a job application on, on a fluke. And they just showed up here. You know what I <laughs> right, mean? Right, 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 right. <laughs> Literally just by you chance. Know? But, <laughs> you know, so I feel like that'd be the most intriguing way to for us to actually give Brandy a second chance. Mm-hmm. And we could watch her grow in just three. If that's what she chooses to do. Absolutely. Because yeah. she may she she may want to be treated like a Naomi, where we know that yes, she is married to to, to Jimmy mm -hmm. um in real life, but we just rarely see them, you know, cross paths when it comes to TV. But mm -hmm. it, we just know mm -hmm. and she's just her own person and she's isolated and she's doing what she's doing. She may want to do that. Or, again, she may want to come back and she may want to valet, but also be like a little Lena Vega where she may throw in a few moves here and there to help out Cody. But I don't really see Cody needing that because, I mean, it's, it's fucking Cody Rhodes. Yeah, I mean, it's he's Cody one Rhodes. one of the greatest wrestlers on the planet. Yeah. You know what I Legit. mean? Like, I don't I don't see him needing to do that. And he's a baby face at the moment. So, right. again, why, was he, why would he need to do that? Right. Um, but I would love to see her involved in the WWE, even though she is messy, she, she is... She's tone deaf as hell. Um, she's not self-aware by any means. <laughs> that would work. And with how messy and how chaotic oh. this business is, you have to think about it for a moment. <laughs> Nigga says she's you tone just, deaf. You may just hate her for the right reason. She, she is tone deaf. She is. To an extent, she is. I'm not going to lie. But she would make a perfect kill because she's so tone deaf. <laughs> Yo, that would be a fantastic gimmick. Like racially insensitive. You could flip that. What? Yes. Oh my god. 
Yes. That makes sense. That definitely makes sense. And this sense. is the right company to That's take that. That's the right time. This whole company is already. <laughs> they're already. They're already there. You see what they're I They already mean? did it in real life. <laughs> yes. They've been racially insensitive for all these years. What's right. the difference if you bought in Brandy? Right. And what's the difference I if mean... you just made it into a legit gimmick? Like, just put it on screen what Thank everybody's you. thinking already. So. Thank you. Like, the owner of this company, the CEO wore a do-rag and you said the N-word. Like, what's the difference if Brandy comes in bro, here? <laughs> I will never get over the fact that I will never get over the fact that Vince had a do-rag era. Like, not like one time he just popped out. Vince had a do-rag era. Vince had a do-rag era. I'm not over that. Like, really was holding the ECW belt. Do-rag, like, so, like, it, it just makes sense for them to, to go this route, but it's that just really brought back 2007. Like, he really ran into Trump and was like, I'm black now. It's like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, when did you become the oppressed, sir? Like, <laughs> dog. Don't get me started. Nah, dog. We're not going to. No, the way. Please. I, I don't even want to talk about it. And that was funny because that do-rag era was before he actually said the N-word on television. He. And then Booker T and Charmel's reaction. Charmel's reaction. Oh, my God, dog. Like. I know he did not just say what I thought. He just said. said. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nah, I'm weak. No, no, no. But I like going back to damn, what were we talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The racially Brandy. insensitive thing. What Brandy. Do you think about Brandy. So Brandy wrote. So remember a couple episodes ago we were talking about people that have that WWE polish on them. It's hard for them to kind of navigate and be anywhere else. I think that that's the case with Cody and Brandy. Cody more than Brandy because Cody was obviously a more on-screen character than Brandy. But I, I think that when they were in AEW, they were trying to do WWE-esque things. They were trying to do WWE-esque TV 14 things. That's essentially what they wanted to do. Like, I want, I want to be able to have the polished promo, the fancy belt, the pyro entrance, all the glam and glitz that comes with WWE, but I just wanted to cuss a little more and do some a little more extreme things. That's what they wanted in AEW, in addition to the creative freedom. Now that they got that in WWE, I think that they're going to thrive. So as far as Brandy being on screen and her returning to the Mae Young Classic, I think that that would be perfect. Because like you said, one of the beauties of the Mae Young Classic is watching someone progress uh, through each match and seeing their growth and seeing their development. Um, so if Brandy is serious about getting back in the ring, I think that, you know, I think that the Mae Young Classic would be a perfect place to kind of re-debut her. I wouldn't be surprised to see her kind of show up at like a house show. She was already, um, one of my friends literally just texted me talking about what's Vince McMahon doing now. I'll put you on bro later, bro. But um, he, um, I, I think that uh, Brandy's going to pop up at like a house show because she's already doing matches in the PC. Uh, on Fridays, because I think that that was part of the the report was that, you know, she's doing these Friday matches at the PC, which is kind of like a time for people to get their reps in and kind of, you know, show off what they had and the progress that they had. So I wouldn't be surprised if a house show was next. But I, I do see that as an avenue for Brandy to come back. What about something? The Rock's daughter, she was um, on a few house shows and she was doing something in NXT or whatnot. Mm -hmm. You think that she would go in the Mae Young Classic? You think that Hunter would throw her in there? Absolutely. Or he would just take his time with introducing her? I think that she would be put in the Mae Young Classic because I feel like Hunter's version of WWE is very wrestling-centric. I feel like she's going to start her off in the Mae Young Classic because she's a new one. She's a new woman when it comes to WWE, when it comes to NXT, and I feel like that's a great way of just introducing her as a legitimate competitor. I feel like all of the women that we've been introduced to that we've fallen in love with were introduced via competition bianca belair Rhea ripley tony storm all those women have been introduced via competition and have kind of had their origin story in the may young classic we look at bianca belair who was this fresh athletically gifted rookie who lost in the second or third round and cats was literally like yo you need to sign her and that put a chip on her shoulder. That loss put a chip on her shoulder. That was the foundation of the EST character, right? Same thing with Rhea Ripley, mm -hmm. right? We go into the, the Mae Young Classic and, you know, her injury against, not her injury, but she was wrestling Tegan Knox. Tegan Knox gets injured. Well, that shit was so funny. Rhea Ripley kind of <laughs> looks, at, looks at her in character and was like, uh. And that set the tone. 
that set the tone for Rhea Ripley. So when you think she about, she became with this whole dickhead. Right. Oh my god, that era was so funny. It was so you know, she, funny. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sidebar: the funniest thing she ever pulled was for Halloween. She put on a knee brace. <laughs> it was BT and Knox. <laughs> But that's the thing. But, but but like, think about it. That's the thing that set the tone. So it's like, I feel like when you're introduced to to these women, you have to give them an origin story. Like that's that's one of the things they kind of talk about in wrestling is what's your why? Like, sell me on your why. What motivates you to do what you do? And I feel like what better mm-hmm. way to give a character motivation than by putting them in a situation that can either motivate them to aspire to be something or can give them motivation going forward outside of that context. So I do think that the Rock's daughter being introduced in that manner is like the perfect way for her to debut. So, but what about you? How do you feel about it? About her being introduced in that way? In that way, yeah. Oh, I would love that because I actually feel sorry for her Mm. because, um, and I blame Charlotte for this, because, (laughs) (laughs) all right, why, why do I blame Charlotte? Charlotte took on her daddy's whole persona. Yeah. Except that, you know, her daddy did it well and then she didn't. So God people damn. are expecting her to come in and try to see if she could be, you know, a female counter- counterpart to the most electrifying man in sports entertainment, which nobody could do. I'm sorry. Nobody can no do it. Even the greatest, the great can't do it. Like Chris Jericho is one of the greatest Mike talkers ever out there. And he, he's still not the rock. Right. Like, and they're, they're, they're neck and neck with how good they are and how they could just pull a crown. He's still not it. Right. So I feel bad for her because if she tries to even go in with like leading that, yeah, I am the rock's daughter, then we're going to expect that out of her. Right. Because again, Charlotte did that. Charlotte couldn't even let go of the fucking robe. And it's been how many years now? All right. Like every the, time the fucking theme music and everything. Sorry. You're good. No, anytime I think of Charlotte, what? I was just thinking about how Naya really put the beats on that girl. Like <laughs> Naya put like, the beats two piece on her. Yo, bing, bing. What is you talking about? <laughs> Yo, like I was like, oh, but keep going about Yo, keep going, I never keep going. Stand Naya so hard. <laughs> Keep going, keep going. I never stand her so high. I'm sorry, I'm you sorry. You good, you good, you good. But yes, when it came to when it comes to Charlotte, she <laughs> she lacks a personality, so she kind of literally copy and pasted what her daddy's doing, and we expected some character to come out of her because that that was the the most the the, the biggest selling point to Rick, like mm-hmm. how much energy he brought to the microphone or character that he brought into the ring you know what i mean right he did a lot of little things that no one else could make iconic iconic you know what i mean and that's the same thing with the rock and it just came off to them natural right and i see why she came in with a name change immediately mm-hmm. and i also see why she gets irritated when people ask her questions about her father because it's like you guys are already trying to put us in a box um or like you're put already, us neck and neck yeah yeah, and you're also trying to size her up because, again, she she's not dumb. She watches the show, too. Mm-hmm. She sees what we do to Charlotte every week, how I chew her out every single week. Just she, you. She, she's a smart woman. Sis said, I've seen this girl Monique. <laughs> I've seen this girl Monique chew up Charlotte. I'm not trying to be that bitch. So I... Right? I'm, I'm just going to change my name. She's going to change my name. Who's the Rock's daughter? That's not me. A... <laughs> Mm-mm, not me. <laughs> Literally, but she's she's very intelligent. I love that she changed her name, and she's coming in with with the, just trying to just be herself, and she wants us to get used to that. She's she's coming in there, and she's I'm she's like I'm Ava Rain. Right. Get used to it. Right. I'm I'm yes, I am off camera, the Rock's daughter, but like when 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 the mic when the mics and the cameras on, like we forget about that, and this is this is who who you're getting. Right. Okay. So I feel like if we were to get her in the Mae Young Classic and we could hear her version of what she wants to be presented in her origin story and her video package, I feel like that would be excellent for setting the tone mm-hmm. so that she doesn't even have to run into that issue. Because if Vince was running this, Vince would force her into that box. Right. Immediately. Absolutely. And try to get her to, you know, because in his head, he would think that it would get her over because she shares the Rock's blood. Right. Well, in all actuality, you're setting this girl for failure. Right, because she knows that she doesn't have her, her she doesn't have the qualities of her father. Nobody does. Nobody. The Rock does. is one of a kind. Right. So I would love to watch to see what she has learned in all her years on on um. I'm not, I don't think she was in the indie. She's just been wrestling school, from my knowledge. Right. Um. 
between the wrestling schools and, and the PC. Um, I would love to see everything that she learned. I would love to see what her personality is like because I don't think anyone knows who she really is besides being The Rock's daughter and Absolutely. her being pretty private and very invasive. Any questions in regards of, um, you know, the connection to her father. So I think that is a brilliant way to introduce her. Um, I'm very interested in seeing what she could do and who she is and just 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 knowing Simone Johnson, just as Simone Johnson. I would love to just know who she is right. and what else does she do besides that confinement. So, yeah, totally love it. I love it as well. I think that she's going to be great when she whenever she pops out. But, man, I'm, I'm, I, I hope that WWE actually decides to do a May Young classic. Um, if y'all trying to see another May Young classic, another evolution to let us know via whatever, whatever you're watching this on. Now, I think that concludes the show. Um, but there was there was a, a one more question that I had, but I don't think it's it's going to be relevant. It was, you know, talking about the WWE mid-card titles uh, as far as the identity for each championship. Well, expand on it. So, so I feel like I feel <laughs> like when we talk about like championships, every championship has an identity. And I uh, noticed that, like, with increased focus on the titles and it actually being, like, given prestige, like, obviously you have the U.S. title, you have the Intercontinental title, but it's like, oh, one's the Workhorse Championship, or what does that mean for the other championship, or that championship is the Workhorse title, and then there's this other championship. I was going to say, do you have any, do you, like, what should the identities be for the, the U.S. and the Intercontinental Championship? If any. Mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of worded it perfectly. I I like the fact that with um, Hunter being in control, you definitely do see that they're being taken um, seriously, if not more seriously, from just a couple weeks we've been watching. Mm -hmm. um, they have their own identity, like you just said, but they almost feel like they're more important, more interesting mm -hmm. than the world titles, which I love that for them because... <clears throat> I can only imagine what it's like being a WWE talent and then knowing that you're being thrown into the mid cards and then just the mid cards kind of almost translate into, all right, like you're, you're going for the job or title. Like you might as well mm. go for the 24 seven belt right. while you're at it. Right. Because they don't put any compelling storylines behind um, the mid card titles. They hot potato the belt to the point where no one really cares about it or they'll slap it on one person for months, but then they don't really defend it very often. I love the fact that Hunter is taking it seriously and he is um, making it a point that, Hey, like these guys matter too. And so do these bells, they have history and um, you know, we're, we are not going to take away any of their prestiges. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty much, I guess, my my little take on it. Makes sense. I, I definitely, I definitely hear you out on that. I think I was thinking about the IC title and the US title, and I was also thinking about Hunter's kind of fascination with the old territories. Like, if you notice, like with NXT, he was trying to develop a territorial system, uh, like globally. I say that to say yeah. that I think that the titles should kind of have like some stipulations to them, like. If in, in the NWA, there, there used to be kind of like this thing with the TV title, which was if you defend it 10 times, you get a shot at the world title. Um, then they also oh. do stuff where like, well, in old territories, what they used to do was every territory had a national champion, right? Had a U.S. champion. And what would happen is if you're the U.S. champion, when the world champion comes to your town, you automatically get first dibs. I like that. I, I, I like I, that very much, actually. So I was like, I feel like the U.S. championship, I feel like, especially now that WWE owns all this IP, how dope would it be for them to be like, well, if you defend the title like six times successfully, you get a shot at the WWE championship. Or, I never thought about that, and I love or, that because like it, it's like a stepping stone. Exactly. Because, like I always thought about that to myself, but I never like – 
quite figured out a way to make it make sense. And I'm so right. happy you just brought it up because it's just like, all right, if someone has been holding their own in this division, how do they move up to a world title? Right. You know what I mean? Like Absolutely. I never was able to make that connection on how do you cross that bridge? Cause it's just right. like, all right, that person has been defending their asses off. Are, uh, what happens when they lose the belt and how mm. do they get themselves to get into the loop of the world title or where right. they can even be in a situation where they could possibly be a dual champion. Right. So that's actually like, that's brilliant. I didn't even know that was a thing. So you know, that, thank you for informing me of that. No problem. And I think that it will also be good for storytelling because imagine the, the stipulation is if you defend the U.S. title six times and, you know, successfully, then that means that you get elevated to this place of where you can challenge for the for the world title. But like in your sixth defense, like an old enemy comes back and disrupts the match. Now it's like I was I was this close to getting a shot at WWE title and then I just lost everything. But now you have that That's feud. Good. And then that could be a stepping stone for him to get a US title shot. You know what I mean? Long There's so many ways. Bucking. You know what I mean? I'll be thinking this shit. But um <laughs> I feel like I feel like with with these identities, but going from that, because th those are just ideas that I had for the championship. I feel like the Intercontinental Championship should be like not just for international superstars, but I feel like superstars who have an international resume. Like, I feel like if you are a guy that's competed in New Japan or Rev, Rev Pro or has been a, a world travel champion, I feel like you should challenge for the Intercontinental Championship because I feel like in addition to a lot of charismatic champions holding that belt, that Intercontinental Championship represents, you know, I think it's like the North America and Europe. So it's like you want to be the best of those continents. And so it it's only makes sense that you, char you, chain you charge, you challenge for that title. But I feel Absolutely. like the U.S. title can be, mm -hmm. I feel like the U.S. title can be a title that, can be considered a workhorse championship, but have a little bit, um, not just prestige to it, but has some stipulations to it where you can challenge for the WWE title. And it can also be a title that pays tribute to the United States territories and, you know, companies. Like, I think that if you were in TNA, Impact, Ring of Honor, you should go for the U.S. title, right? I feel like the U.S. title could pay homage Ooh can pay homage to those I love the way your brain works. I be thinking or whatever. <laughs> you feel me? But I, I, I hire you, bitch. Listen, <laughs> listen, that would be conflict of interest because I this is first. But I, I, <laughs> I, I think that they can they can utilize their championships to kind of pay homage to different wrestling companies, even if there was like U.S. title matches and the champion gets to decide the rules and then he can take, like, the rules from, like, a promotion that he was in. So, say if there was, like, a Ring of Honor guy who challenged for the U.S. title and he, like, was the champion. And, like, let's let's just say, hmm, Ring of Honor, former champion. Samoa Joe. Let's just say Samoa Joe had the U.S. championship. He was in WWE. Oh, and he's, awesome. and you say, and you say, okay, well, this U.S. title match is a pure rules match. So, now he's taking, like, the Ring of Honor rules and he's, using that to pay homage to ring of honor. So I think that would be a great way to kind of give each title an identity, but it was just a little idea, some stuff that I had in my head. No, that's actually a fantastic idea. I hope Hunter's hearing this. Yeah. Hunter, I hope <laughs> you're hearing phone, this. Hunter. Pick up the phone. All right. Run culture to check. Okay. But, <laughs> but I, I think that that concludes today's show. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We're going to be back next week whole new slate of topics be sure to rate the podcast give it five stars like comment share and subscribe thank you guys so much for tuning and tapping in and we'll see you guys next week